Yeah. It's a little bit of a different talk on this one. So I'm going to talk about a lot about fish, um, <laughs> but and kind of into the oceans. Um, so a friend of mine kind of inspired me a little bit of this talk because uh, he's a bit of a coy car up there and uh, looks after his fish and treats them like pets. Uh, but as you move into the cloud, you need to kind of change your way of thinking about how you look after your workplace. And um, so if you want to keep your fish alive, so you need to think about how the like, quality of water are your, all your pumps working. So think your data centers, where you deploy your workloads. So you've got loads more responsibility. And you need to care about every one of your quality car. So you've got to protect them from predators, things dive in together. And you want to make sure that the power's there and you keep an eye on and make sure, make sure they don't get ill. And if one of your fish gets ill, what do you do? Because if they're all in the same pond and it affects the other ones, why haven't you all your fish? They're going to die. So you need to, <laughs> you need to think about how you're looking after all your workloads and how you're protecting and segmenting them out. Um, and if, if one of them gets poorly, you need to treat one of them. You can't give the other ones the love that they need. Um, so you really need to be careful about like, how you're looking after the fish at that point. Um, so this kind of what we're thinking about like, the analogies in the cloud and cloud security more generally. Um, because if you're still operating a, more traditional way, and you're running your services in your own data centers or even on premise, you've got so much more responsibility and so many more things to think about. And when you compare this to what you can get in the cloud, there's a lot of benefits from shifting and moving across into the cloud if you do it in the right way. So, in a lot of the cloud providers, they've, they've been designed from the ground up with security in mind. Now, in your data centers, a lot of the time, you're relying on a mixture of your own people to go in and make sure that the services are patched or updated. People sitting between racks, plugging wires and getting all that sort of stuff working. Whereas in the cloud providers, you don't really have to think about that so much because that responsibility is taken out of your hands. Um, because if you think about the shared responsibility model in the cloud, even in an infrastructure as a service environment, much of that is done for you. So you have much less responsibility to worry about. And as an organisation, you can start to focus more on business value. And if you can focus on the business value for your business, you can get much more traction in what you're doing. But you have to think about how you build in a simplest, in a, like build the simplest service you can, and not introduce complexity where you don't need it. But the benefit of that in the cloud providers is they're built for automation from the start. Most of the services have APIs built into them, you can authenticate to them, and build your services in a way that you can start to get to value and reduce the total of your teams as you work through. So if we go back to kind of our on-prem and data center approach. So you've, you've, got, you've gone from having your little data center in your, in your office or wherever it is, you move into a colon. So now you've got lots of other programs that help it. And so you've got the same problem that's just scaled up even more. So you've still got to manage all the server hardware and the switches, making sure your network is work, working. Think about geo redundancy and where you're running your services. So as you move into the, into the cloud providers, you think about where you deploy your services into different regions. So you've got the geographic separation about where your services are running. So if there's an earthquake or a flood somewhere, your services are running in the right regions. And then think about the availability of your services as well. So do you need to run multiple instances of your services within, within one, one region? So you're running across the different zones there. And this is where you get a lot of benefits of moving into the cloud or, in this case, the ocean. So, you've got your big cloud providers like AWS, GCP, Azure. We haven't mentioned Oracle Cloud later on, but I don't really know anyone using Oracle. Um, so, someone, someone must do. <laughs> um, and then, you might be using like a managed service provider to help you with some of this sort of stuff as well. But by moving into the cloud, you get the scalability and the visibility that you need in your services. So by moving in this way, it's much easier for you to maintain your services if you do it in the right way. Because if you can convince your organisation to move into the cloud in, in a sensible way, you can start to do away with some of the shadow IT that you might see. Because if you get teams spinning up a project over here for something, a project over there for something, it's likely because your organisation isn't agile enough to adapt to their needs. And if you're able to move into the cloud and give them the capabilities that they need, and allow them the freedom to build in those environments, you'll get a much better understanding about what's there. Because ultimately, the cloud providers want to build you for all this stuff. And if you just move straight to the cloud, it might cost you a lot of money to start off with. 
but you can start to see where your services are because the asset information you get from the billing information and the asset inventories help you understand what's in your cloud and from a security standpoint, if you don't know what you've got, you can't protect it. So understanding what's in your cloud environment and then thinking about how you classify the importance of your assets you've deployed in the cloud is really important. So building information is a source of truth, it's really, really helpful. Um, I mentioned around kind of the network activity and the, the, the geo redundancy. So because you're in the big cloud providers, you've got a lot of like firepower there in terms of connectivity, and the cloud providers are built there to help you defend against attacks as well, which we'll come on to later on. But all of this comes back to getting the visibility of your services and getting to the times of value for your organization. But, the challenge with this is a bit of an iceberg if you're not careful. Don't lift and shift. Because if you just do a lift and shift, you're not going to get benefits to the cloud on the own. Now, I spent a long time working in government, um, and I've seen this happen quite a few times. So you get a new badge transformation program come along. Um, and it does a lot of the work to move into the cloud, but only does half the work. So you'll take a lot of your stuff that you've got on your on-premise or in your own data centers, and you'll just lift and shift into the cloud with the same mindset of how you're working. So you'll move across all your old workloads, all your legacy applications in, get up and working, which can be a fine strategy if you're just trying to get started and get your services out of an old data center or save some money because you've got a legacy contract there and you need to make that first move. But, there's a big but. The challenge then is, like, how do you then operate that service in the cloud in a scalable way that's cost effective and you don't introduce more security vulnerabilities. So when you're moving across and doing a lift and shift on migration, there are some things you can think about. So because you're doing away with a lot of network switches, you can think about how you connect your services together and use your VPC rules to protect around what can transfer between different, different zones. You can use the load balancing and the, the inbuilt WAFs within the cloud providers, so things like Cloud Arm or the AWS WAFs to help protect some of the legacy applications. And then you get some DDoS protection at box for these as well, because the cloud providers have seen this for a long time, they know what's coming through. And they can scale and take, take the network load that you can't, you can't sell in your own data centers. So this, this is, helps you get a lot of wins from the translation earlier on. And also, because the cloud providers want to give you visibility about how you're operating, you can get some of that to start off with and get you up and running. So in AWS, you've got things like Security Hub, uh, which bring together the findings from things like Guard Duty, the AWS IAM Analyzer, and also AWS Inspector, which scans your workloads. And you can bring those together to a uniform, unified kind of dashboard that you can then use to understand what's happening in your services. Within Google Cloud, you can use um, the Security Health Analytics, and there's different tiers of that because they want to sell you more things, but ultimately, if you, if you pay more money, you get more capability. And you can take that choice early on. But it gives you some a way of getting up and running and getting started. Now, I'm quite a big proponent of using the SIS benchmarks as a way of kind of baseline your configuration of where you are. Now, the, the Centre of Internet Security consensus benchmarks around configuration. So, those configurations aren't just defined by um, someone sat in the corner of a room, they're by industry experts across the board. So, they tend to be relatively pragmatic. And they're also configurations that you can enable without requiring commercial tools to do so. So particularly in like GCP or AWS, these are things and configurations that you can set up. And it helps you get a good understanding of um, how your services are configured and where you might have some weaknesses in your configuration early on. But the other challenge with this is if you're moving from kind of an on-prem based center and moving into the cloud, you might not have the skills in your workforce and you might be geared up for it either. Um, so, I, the fish out of water comes to mind, I couldn't find a good picture of that for this one. Um, but you need to get people to reskill and think about how they're going to operate in the cloud. Um, and the little kind of hockey stick graph you've got here is thinking about how you reduce like, change complexity. Um, so, many of you have heard of uh, Martin Fowler, who's done a lot with enterprise architecture over the years. Now, if you think about how often you make a change, if it's something you don't do very often, it's going to feel much more difficult to do it. And so if you can start to build the skills and the muscle about how you do these changes frequently, and make sure you're practicing them on a regular basis, 
you'll be able to respond and change to things much more easily. And so, if you take an example on here of deployment of services, if you're going through a change cycle that's on a monthly basis, and you're able to bring that down and have confidence to deploy more frequently and roll back if you need to. They're things you can do in the cloud much more easily with confidence. And it also means that you're able to respond to security threats much more quickly because you're not waiting, waiting for a patch cycle for a month to deploy a patch. So you can start to reduce that window of opportunity. And you also have to think about how you treat your infrastructure. So moving away from having your quick car, you treat your fish wild cups more like sardines or herring. So if you, if you lose a few of them, you're not really too worried. That's, that's the cost of it, but it's easy to get some more of them. Now, from AWS and GCP, like on AWS there's a Cloud Guru, which is really good for like, self-learning and, and understanding what's going on. And Google has Cloud Skills Boost, so you can go in and do interactive labs and learn about how these services work and practice it. So if, going back to kind of the complexity side of things, you can start to remove some of that complexity by practicing and using these tools day to day and learning how to set them up in the right way. Now think about some of the key kind of components of building and moving your architectures across. Think about how you secure your IAM environment, so what, what are you doing about identity access management? Now, I'm going to talk mostly about GCP, but in GCP, permissions are inherited from the top down, so you've got an organisation, folders, projects, and then resources. So if you think of these as your organisation being a shark, your folders being a squid, and your projects being salmon, and then your resources being sardines. So at the bottom level, the sardines, if you lose one of those, you're really not too worried. And so when you're assigning the IAM permissions, you want to get the minimum set permissions you can to those resources. And which means that blast rate is small if something goes wrong and gets abused. Whereas if, you, if your shark gets compromised, this will go to equal sorts of things. So you want to be really careful about how you assign roles in your organisation and how you use service accounts across the board. Now, in GCP, and they have basic roles, which are things like editor, viewer, uh, administrator. They're really coarse grain. Now, they come by default when you create your projects, and they kind of get them up and running really fast, which are fine for development environments. But when you're running production workloads, you need to think about the very least use of predefined roles, which are a bit more granular and more targeted. And wherever you can, try and assign those roles at the lowest level you can and make use of uh, groups and labels that you use on your resources. So you set, set the right precedent about how you're managing those resources. And things like Terraform, which we mentioned earlier on for infrastructure automation, or Cloud Deployment Manager, or uh, Cloud Formation in AWS. Having these, so you start to deploy your code as code, rather than having it uh, as click-offs, is going to make a huge improvement your confidence about how you deploy services. Um, and as you get a bit more advanced and you get a bit further through, you can start to think about using conditional role bindings and downscaping credentials. So in AWS, uh, you can assume the role of a resource. So when you, when you change from one role to another, rather than inheriting all of your IAM permissions you've got now and the machine permissions, you drop all of your rights and you act just as the IAM role that, that service has got, which means it limits the radius for things to go wrong, and when you go in, you're acting as that service. Um, but you also get telemetry and the login that goes behind it. Now, you also need to think about how you access the cloud services, so how do you federate your identity across? So in GCP, in GoCard, we, we, we use G Suite across the board as well, so we're able to federate the identity across from G Suite to GCP. But equally, you could do that with Active Directory or Opta to assign your identities across. But think about how you can manage those identities. And as, we, as I was mentioned earlier on, think about how you manage joiners and leavers. And really, you want to avoid having a leavers process. Because if someone's moving from one place to another, really, you should be dropping all their old permissions and giving them new permissions again, as if they've just joined the company. And so they don't accumulate credentials. And as you design for scale, think about like, how you can use private VPCs. So the data never traverses the internet. Just saves within your cloud environment that you're using, and use tags to help you scan up the services up and down. So rather than um, having uh, an individual resource level, you use tags and labels to scan your resources up and down 
a group level, so you, you, you can simplify how you think about your services and logically separate out the layers. So think about dolphins right, in this one. And so they'll, they'll fight off whales by grouping together, and sharks by, by working together as a, as a group to defend. And if you think of this from like a, a DDoS type scenario, they're all working together to, to take over that load and to make sure it can stay, stay up and stay resilient. And so, talk about firewalls already as well. And then defending against attack, you've got um, cloud endpoints you can use which have built in WAF functionality with GCP and security health analytics. So making use of the capabilities in the ocean. So if you think of a little ground fish or Nemo on here, hides away in the sea anemone and to get the protection, the sea anemone is giving them the, the visibility and the understanding about what's going on and helping them protect them from the process. Um, but obviously applying the principle of least privilege. And then as you think about secrets and how you build, build your services, your secrets management is a massive challenge. And this is really difficult to get right as well. So you can use the native tools within the cloud providers. So with AWS, you've got things like SSM and secrets manager in, in uh, GCP, which are, are really easy to use, like key value and the storage there. And if you've got some more like more complicated use cases, things like HashiCorp Bolt are really useful for this. Um, and you can tie this in to your workload identity. So if you're using things like Kubernetes, um, which a couple of people in the crowd here are more experts on than I am. Um, but you can use that to manage how the secrets are granted to your services and control what gets access to those credentials. And then as you think about your build pipelines, how are you authenticating your build pipelines into your cloud providers and granting the access they need to go and deploy those services? And think about what they're deploying. So most people are moving towards container-based architectures and for a lot of their apps and services now. So how do you make sure your containers are free of vulnerabilities and you're scanning those in your build pipelines? And you go a step further as well. So when you think about your Kubernetes and what you're deploying to your clusters, you can start to build admission controls and say, if your, if your container is inside and it doesn't have, and it has high risk vulnerabilities, we're not going to allow you, allow you to deploy that workload. So you can put more and more controls in place about how you work. And think about the logging, you get the visibility through the logging in the cloud wire tools. So you get loads of telemetry that comes through that you can make use of. Now you might not necessarily want to use just the GCP native tool for this stuff, but it gives you a place to start from and build your capability. And if you think about how you build new services in a event driven way, rather than having to have lots of, kind of third party tools or, or big batch processes, you can start to build for scale as you, as you work through it. Um, and this really gives you kind of a, a very high level overview of the different ways you think about moving into the cloud and adapting to your workloads that you put through there. Um, there's a load more detail that you go into behind this. Um, I'll try to keep it relatively high level for today. Uh, and with that, um, if you've got any questions or you want to reach out to me, you can find me on Twitter and LinkedIn. Thank you.